Hi, welcome to another episode of the Visual Storytelling Today podcast. The show is designed for you, the marketer or entrepreneur, who may be looking for more effective ways to connect better with audiences through the exciting world of visual storytelling. We will introduce you to inspiring experts from diverse industries that bring fresh perspectives on how to capture attention, build trust, emotional empathy, and last but not least, drive business results. Enjoy the show. Hi, I'm Shlomi Ron. I'm the CEO of the Visual Storytelling Institute, and we're based here in Miami, Florida, and we're all about bringing the gospel of visual storytelling from the world of art, be it film, video, photos, all the way up to the metaverse these days, and bring it to a new generation of marketers and business leaders that want to really break this communication noise and connect better with their audiences. So one of the things that uh, have been on many people's minds <laughs> lately is all this, uh, all this rage about the metaverse and the NFTs. And we have a whole class of the uh, people that actually were accumulating fortune in virtual assets. And one of the things that uh, came to mind is how can you really successfully manage all these virtual assets uh, in the metaverse uh, during your lifetime, but also the day after? And that's a question that uh, all of a sudden become very timely. And I thought, and, and by the way, this could be your virtual badge, it could be your digital twin, it could be your digital business, it could be a wild range of assets. So for you, the business leader or marketer, this is really important questions. So to help me out with this uh, exciting topic, I invited my good friend, uh, Sarah Adami Johnson. She's a senior wealth planning consultant at BMO Private Wealth Group. And BMO, for those of you who don't know, this is the Bank of Montreal. Welcome to the show, Sarah. Thank you so much for having me. I'm honored to be here with you. Excellent. Excellent. This is great. So before we jump right into, you know, the weeds, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your backstory, how, what was your journey like, and what made you start actually uh, choosing a career in uh, wealth planning, in particular, with this specialty in metaverse assets? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you for that opportunity. Before I start, I actually want to acknowledge that even though this conversation is virtual, very much yeah. so, <laughs> I am actually sitting um, in the unceded territory of the Celics of the Okanagan people. And I have the honor to, to be delivering uh, this wonderful interview from, uh, from the sacred place. So oh, wow. I think it's really great to pay homage to our ancestors, um, especially when we're speaking about a metaverse, yeah. <laughs> which is a virtual reality space, which exactly. is really beyond the reach of the physical. Mm -hmm. um, so, so my story, really, I started to get involved in digital assets when I was a trainee at the Dutch Central Bank in Amsterdam. I mm -hmm. was working there right at the turn of the century, right. <laughs> 1999, <laughs> when, when the Dutch Central Bank was actually in charge of the uh, Uni European Union uh, unification of the currencies. Oh, I see. And, and so we were looking at what, in the legal department, what is the best way to take away all the different regional currencies right. and introduce the euro. And one of the ways was to digitize and tokenize currencies and mm. e-money. So I was presented with amazing white papers and studies from Dave Chum. You know, at that right. time, he was the guru of digital signatures, yeah. uh, the startup of the blockchain. Yeah, and, I remember that. Mm -hmm. Right? And this, this whole idea of really... Um, you know, taking the physical and making it metaphysical. Exactly. Um, um, and, and it was really with the idea of making it easier for people to get used to um, a new reality, which was the European uh, Union new currency. Right. So since then, um, my passion, you know, for, for applied computer sciences and mathematics, you know, for tokenizations, oh, wow. what, did, what does it mean to tokenize something? What does it mean to take it from a, a, a being a real thing into translating it literally into yep. a different language, such as the coding language? Um, and then use it, you know, use it to make it easier to transact um, and, and make, you know, and make and universalize 
um, this, this, this either currencies or assets. So from then, um, with the advent of 2008 and mm -hmm. the invention of the blockchain, Nakamoto, yep. the, white protocol, the white paper introducing Bitcoin and then uh, Vitalik uh, Buterin with the Ethereum, uh, which, by the way, uh, you know, for us in British Columbia, Vancouver was kind of the, mm -hmm. it was on the news for the first time right. <laughs> in the new century. Um, and, and again, we were coming out of a really great, you know, the great uh, meltdown of the uh, financial markets and yeah. the housing market in 2008, which, you know, being in the financial industry and being a planner, uh, you know, was resonated really strongly with me. Yeah, so, I can imagine. Mm -hmm. So that was the path. And I started to really become a self-learner, uh, taking as many courses as possible, taking back from that time where I left. Uh, yeah. Kind of technological, um, you know, passion, and um, I would say that one of the biggest uh, contributor to, to, you know, really my learning curve was uh, belonging um, to the steering committee of STEP of the uh, uh, Society for Estate Planning Practitioner. Oh, I see. And their digital assets group, uh, mm -hmm. which is a special interest group. So I've been in the steering committee, um, you know, for a few years now, since 2015. And we've really, uh, we deep dive in research. Um, you know, we stay current on, on anything because we're considered the advisors to the advisors. Oh, wow. And so, yeah. um, and then, you know, taking courses, uh, the Open University at It's MIT. constantly changing, right? So, I mean... Yes. It I'm just, you know, blown away every time, you know, I'm coming across articles that, you know, just the other day about visual influencers, you know, characters that doesn't exist <laughs> and that are much more effective than, you know, real people. I mean, it's constantly changing and evolving and <clears throat> you got to keep pace uh, because, you know, you got to adapt yourself to a new uh, reality all the time. So. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we adapt, uh, you know, either for personal curiosity or in my case because clients are asking questions you know yeah. um, we have i only work with uh, ultra uh, high net worth and ultra high net worth families mm -hmm. and what happens is that they want to know <laughs> yeah know? and they are the people that actually invest or spend money um in digital assets and sometimes not even knowing that they're doing that you know if you buy right. a book but you buy it on a kindle that's a digital asset. You're not really buying the book. You're only buying a licensing to read the book. Exactly. So now, you know, you could be spending hundreds of thousands of dollars. You have your Kindle with, you know, so many publications. But then the question is, who do you leave your Kindle to? But can you even do that? Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like your iTunes songs. You can't. Exactly. Exactly. Like yeah. So dead, it's yeah. Gone. No, it's, it's really bring up so many questions that never existed before. And I think you know, that's why I'm kind of curious to kind of touch on some of them. But let's start from the top, you know, kind of go easy on people because, you know, it's so new to a lot of people. So I want to kind of level set a little bit. So since we're talking about this new topic called metaverse, you know, from your perspective, how would you define it? Uh, this is wonderful because I heard so many different things and, and even your, your previous guests has tried to come yeah. up with their own definition. So I'll try my own. So um, I do believe that there are certain characteristics. So the idea that it is immersive, uh, that it is digital, so it's not a yeah. physical reality. And the idea that, in, you know, I heard you asking the questions before, what makes a difference from, you know, second life and things like that. Well, the idea that it is, I think, a marketplace. You know, it's a brand new world where brands, uh, games, businesses, mm -hmm. services right. can actually do business mm -hmm. and people can actually own assets that are right. in digital format. Yeah. So I think that that's the real great differentiator. Um, it's this idea of ownership. And Web3, really, you know, if Web2 was the idea of sociality, social media, you know, yeah. the interactivity, you know, the right. posting of comments and all this other stuff, the creation of a community at a level of, you know, the influencers, the posting and all this other stuff. Yep. Um, the metaverse is where your like, your buying becomes the new liking. 
Mm, and, yeah, it's kind of vote of confidence. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And mm -hmm. also, you know, your inventory, your digital inventory list. So your digital assets inventory list becomes your mm -hmm. kind of batch of honor. <laughs> Right. The more right. you have, the more, the, you know, the, the more you can use, the more you can show off with, you know, so you can have. It's like a status symbol in a way. Absolutely. hundred yeah. percent. Um, yeah. yeah. So you can be running around with the latest Adidas Balenciaga <laughs> yeah. or Dolce & Gabbana outfit, um, you know, or your fully metaverse, um, right. you know, dematerialized outfit. Right. You have entire uh, luxury items and, uh, you know, creators from architects to fashion designers. Um, so even owning, you know, a, 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 a specific house in the metaverse that looks in a specific way and has a specific neighbor will mean something, right? Right, or right. Or is already meaning something or being right. invited to virtual concerts and, and keeping the concert stab in an NFT format. Right. Know, like a, a memento that has a value that is detached from the experience. You already been to the concert, but now you have something that, you know, and we like personally, uh, you know, I went to uh, my first, you know, concert like back then, uh, the Foo Fighters, and I still have the ticket. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I would never give that up. And right. it means nothing to anyone else but me, right? Yeah, but you have the story attached to it. So for you, exactly, it makes sense. Exactly. <clears throat> yeah. exactly. And so if we create this digital footprint of memories in the metaverse where all of a sudden the ticket, the certified, you know, uh, registry of that Got event it. actually does have value because it's finite in the sky. Yeah. So. yeah, and I totally agree. I mean, I think, you know, the glaring difference from previous uh, virtual worlds attempts like, uh, you know, Second Life and others it's really like the economy, like the blockchain economy that makes it uh, so powerful. And the fact that it's also, it makes the individual also uh, kind of democ democratize the ability to own things and, and really in a decentralized uh, fashion, I think that's also something that was never available to that extent. So giving artists, especially, you know, the opportunity to create their own art and be able to sell it with no middlemen, <laughs> for example, in this case. Yeah. So <laughs> you introduce a really good point because this idea of the decay of the intermediary, you know, and, and right. the, the probably the emergence of a different type of intermediary, which is education based. So, you know, yes, it's true. Artists can now create and I would say they, they can mint this certificate and they can sell their art without right. intermediation up to a point they still need the platform yeah of course right? they yeah need they, they need to get right? gas they need to pay gas money as well <laughs> they need to do that and yeah. all this other stuff but but yeah. what i feel that there is uh, um, an emergence of is actually consultants um which are you know specialized lawyers and art advisors right galleries that are now creating experiences for artists that are you know are going to to into this digital um, certificate world and also the you know the idea that there is still a piece of art that is detached from its, its certificate and needs right. specific contracts uh metadata um, for the actual ownership of the piece. You know, right. the, the biggest news that came out this yesterday was uh, the son of John Lennon, I think, created an NFT um, mm -hmm. for certain video pieces. Um, but it was really clear that the object themselves that are, mm -hmm. um, you know, displayed in these videos are staying with him. He's not oh. selling anything that is oh, physical. Oh, I see. But he's giving up the, the, you know, the digitalized twin of, as you mentioned, of, right. of, you know, of the experience in an NFT format. And I think that's a really interesting thing. And this is why the emergence of this new consultant that creates this level of education for either the new collectors or the artists, they have to understand what is it that they're selling, I see. Um, how they're going to be receiving their royalties, for example, they need a wallet. <laughs> so let's talk is, about that. This is kind of interesting, yeah. you know, going back to your role as a estate planner or wealth planner, when you work with your clients, you know, and you 
first of all, what question they have about the metaverse and what particular areas we're actually helping them with, you know, yeah, asset this... types and challenges. Yeah, no, that's great. So we see clients with digital assets that can go, as I said, from emails <laughs> to cloud-based uh, pictures to cryptocurrencies mm -hmm. to NFTs. So each specific digital assets uh, require, right. require uh, ad hoc estate planning. Mm -hmm. And estate planning is really um, interesting because you have to do estate planning. So you have to think about your death, but right. you have to do the planning while you're alive. Exactly. And, and, and the world keeps on moving, you know, yep. like estate plans that we have done five, 10 years ago, even 10 years ago, um, now they have to be constantly revised because either the inventory gets gets longer of the Oh, I see. Or they actually the the characteristic of the of the digital assets are so that they require specific planning. Right. Um, so it it really is the the process starts from the very beginning, which is the way that we engage clients. Either you can talk about it, you cannot, but you cannot not ask. You know, mm. it is a given that now even an eighty year old person, especially now with the pandemic, would have gone to a Zoom meeting with their children or, right. you know, yeah. would, they have uh, some kind of a device, either a smartphone or an iPad or, or anything like that. So that's a digital asset. You know, it could be either in a, um, you know, a hard, you know, hardware format or right. it could be in, in a more, dis, you know, a ethereal <laughs> digital format, a tokenized format. Like on the cloud somewhere, yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So the question has to be posed. And I always says to all my, uh, all my colleagues, don't ask about digital asset because nobody understands what a digital asset is. Ask the specific question. Do you use email? Do you have online banking? Do you read books on a Kindle? You know, make it really simple and, and, and reach out to your clients and asking the right questions. Um, and you cannot afford not to ask. Right. You know, we cannot leave this piece because some of these digital assets actually have great value, financial value. And if it's not financial value, is great emotional value. You know, yeah. I have really, you know, interesting conversation about emails and, uh, you know, uh, online diaries right. that people write about their experiences and they absolutely do not want those things to be disclosed at their, at their death. You know, they're very, very serious about keeping those thoughts mm -hmm. personally. Uh, but how as an executor or um, as a representative of a decedent, uh, you go in or as a trustee, you go in and, and you know, uh, hit delete. <laughs> yeah, document. exactly. You know, first of all, how do you get access to it? And second of all, uh, which powers do you have to actually delete every, anything that is, yeah. you know, in the cloud that is being stored? Do you have the powers? Do you have the authorization to do it? Have we actually um, gone through the exercise of really reflecting on your wishes, on the type of assets that you have? And um, what do you want to have done with right. it? And all this conversation needs to be happening now while yeah, you're alive, right? Exactly. And it needs to be continuously happening. Um, but from, from an ethical perspective, us as planners, mm -hmm. we need to really be careful on, on keeping up to date because we need to be able to understand the risks that each of these of this, you know, digital assets pose. Yeah. Um, either, you know, from a cybersecurity perspective, from an identity perspective, from a privacy perspective. And we must be fluent enough to be able to talk to our clients. And if we're not, we must be very transparent and disclose that. Yeah. So I could be saying, look, I can take you from, from A to, you know, Oh, well, I need to look it up, H you know, and T, research this. Yep. But mm -hmm. WXYZ or whatever. Yeah, I see. Exactly. And we need to be able to tell the client that or right. uh, being able to take executing those plans if they cannot have the conversation with crypto buy and sells and, you know, they don't understand how these things are taxed or moved or, uh, yeah. you know. I mean, there's also the question of, you know, the terminology, even the, just the, the terms digital asset, you know, for marketer, it would mean there's whole digital asset management platform just to manage their videos and photos. And this is what it means to them. But today, digital assets 
you know, along with virtual assets have become, especially in the context of metaverse, something much different and, you know, unique, you know, we're talking about the NFT art, we're talking about, uh, you know, the avatars, uh, there are the currency, uh, the whole uh, virtual land that people are buying. So it, it has become completely, and I'm sure you having this challenge as well, how can you keep up with the new virtual asset types to give your clients the right advice where there are no rules yet because it's so new. <laughs> yeah, it's a challenge, right? It's a challenge. So the way that you have the process is you need to have your client to do an inventory. They really need to open up the kimono, sit down, pen and paper, <laughs> yeah. very unmetaverse and really write down everything that they have. You know, right. you have to have almost like a grid uh, and a map of their mm -hmm. digital footprint, right? right? So all those assets. Then you have to come up with an idea for valuing those assets, mm -hmm. you know? And it could be just, you know, okay, what did you pay for it? And in what currency? <laughs> right. Um, and then try to figure out, okay, is this about a, an asset that will go up in value? Because then, you know, we could plan around it because if we know that it will go up, then we could put it in a trust, for example, right? And insulate that value and that growth or in a, in a specific um, SPVs, like in, in, in a special purpose uh, vehicle so that right. we insulate the risk also from the rest of the estate and the legacy. The third thing is, as you mentioned, the collection management. And the collection management is really, first of all, it, it, it is made by finding the right tools. There are some online tools. So there's technology involved as well, of course. Absolutely. So there is technology to take care of technology. Yep. And then there is a team of people. So mm -hmm. you need to have your team all talking together. So once, once we have identified what the assets are, more or less what their values, therefore what are the risks that are implied in from task or legal uh, tax or legal perspective right. um, then you have to create a team of people that need to be brought in for the next side of the planning and the collection management piece is really interesting because in an nft format it could have um it could have anything that has to do with like art advisors uh that help with um really finding the world where to put the nfts um should it be online or should it be offline uh should it be in a in a separate uh altogether space where you right. need actually access to in order to sell it. And there are these special vaults, um, you know. Where By the way, as you're just describing this, it just came to my mind. Obviously, the typical use case I assume is that a client comes to you and, and as you said, you know, with a pen and paper and list what they have, but would they come to you before they actually plan to buy an NFT art, for example, and ask you for help on the legal smart contract just to make sure that it's done the correct way because there is also legal implication before you know because if they come to you after and they didn't do the the right you know legal protection maybe they are exposed and now it's too late <laughs> so the answer here is it depends who the client is i Got have it. to tell you every time there is a gold rush Mm -hmm. It's more like I'll do something and ask for forgiveness. That's oh, I can. That's the can. general. That's the I general see. attitude. You know, especially with with people that are really into the collecting of the art and mm -hmm. the collecting of the NFT, or they're right. really like passionate about the technology. They just go to the art fair. They they go, or they even you know they get drops. Right. You know, they are now into a, a list of something and they receive NFT. They receive free NFTs or, 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 or free private showing, like maybe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Also private showing. Yeah. They, they may be invited to participate to an experience and all of a sudden they have to deal with the rest that comes out of the experience. Right. Right. So, um, so it really depends. And I would say it would be perfect in a perfect world in the metaverse. Um, you would have a client that before it does anything you know will come mm. and ask for advice but i tell you that hasn't happened for real physical assets you know we ha we have so many clients that they go on a you know on a vacation when you know it is possible to go on a vacation to a wide they fall in love right. with the place and they buy a condo 
Mm-hmm. And then they come to say, oh, you know what? We just bought a condo. So, yeah. and, and you're thinking, oh my goodness, we should have had, you know, a cross-border trust. We should put the condo in there. And there are so many different, you know, issues that comes from doing something and I then see. you have to correct it. <laughs> so because this mentality, this, Impulse Pre-sense. buying, I call it. <laughs> yeah, you just buy stuff because you like yeah. it. You, you get you, if you're lucky enough to have the money, right. you can afford it. You just I get see. it. Um, now, ideally, you would have your lawyers, your planners, and your mm-hmm. accountants on speed dial, and you know you would ask the question. Oh, by the way, I saw this. Can I buy it? And they would just go in and read Give all you. the terms and conditions right. you know, of the platform yeah. and I see. you know tell you everything about the obscure cryptocurrency that the platform requires that Got you may it. never get your money back and, and do all this due diligence does it happen in reality no we're very much human beings and yeah. we're, our behavior it's really emotionally driven <laughs> so 100 yeah. percent so most of the time we actually do post buying planning Right. And the post buying planning is tougher because there might be limitation. There might be cost mm. for the client to undo something and or to move assets in right, the right. structure, uh, which could be tax or could be legal, or could be whatever. Yep. And the cost of the planning is also higher, right? Because now you have to you have Pick to fund for undoing something and doing yep. something new, right? Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. And yeah. I can so, see that. So I wonder, you know, now that you kind of lay out the land for us, say, in metaverse estate planning, if we will, but uh, do you have maybe one or two examples for a a metaverse asset, let's call it virtual asset, uh, that comes from the personal category versus one that is more business, like a digital business, for example, that you had to deal with clients with? That's a really good question. So yes, and I can tell you one asset that could be both. Mm -hmm. So uh, you mentioned virtual land, right? I'm going in and buy virtual land. So um, from a perspective of let's 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 be generational as well. So uh, buying real estate right now in Canada and I know in the U.S. as well is super expensive, and the affordability level is is just almost you know it's really high entry barrier, right? Right. Because of the down payment and, and everything else and the stress tests they are doing to protect you know to, to protect the buyers as well so land in the metaverse is really really popular with younger um younger clients mm-hmm. or younger users of the metaverse because it gives you the idea that you can possess something and then you can stake it so you mm-hmm. can actually rent mm-hmm. it out in the metaverse and made some passive income from it so the right. idea of owning land or owning an apartment in this, you know, metaverse uh, apartment condo building, it is, is moved on the same principle of owning real estate in the mm-hmm. real world. Um, so the motivation, the motivation though is, well, I can afford it if I if I play back gammon for five years and now I have a few million dollars in Bitcoin yeah. <laughs> because I earned it. Um, I can afford a really nice penthouse apartment in the metaverse, even though I might not be able to get that money out of you know, my cryptocurrency account and buy something in, in the physical world. And so um, that's where the land ownership from, from, um, from a personal perspective comes in, right? You have actually currency in the metaverse, mm-hmm. in, in the crypto, and you buy it. From a business perspective, it's twofold. You can buy land to, you know, put a put a, a virtual um, shopping spot, like commercial real rent. commercial real residence or real estate there. Absolutely, and yeah. then you put up your your brand name, like Balenciaga, Birkins, whatever you want it, um, Adami I Johnson's uh, Consulting Ltd, whatever it is, and now you have a a, a metaverse space where people can come and they can meet you and you can have conversation. You can have virtual coffee. You can actually Mm -hmm. give virtual services or sell virtual goods in this space, right? In, 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 in the asset space. Right. And what typical space for, from influencers. Uh, So they, you could actually, Mm -hmm. yeah, go ahead. And what typical platform do you, do you see uh, that are, most of your clients are using for this uh, virtual virtual land? Um, it could be a fashion-based universe. It mm-hmm. could be, uh, you know, uh, right now there are so many experiments that come up. So right. you know, 
people. I mean, everybody's talking about the Facebook things or, you know, there are different platforms because the metaverse is made of different islands. Right. Yep. So depending at the moment. Yeah. At, at the moment. <laughs> so depending on where your customers are. So the number one is know your customer. Number two, go to that island where they are playing or where they are, yep. uh, you know, I see. where you can find them. Right. Right. And then establish a footprint in that island. So uh, that really depends. It depends on your space. Are you in, in the luxury business or you're not? Um, are, are you collaborating or cooperating um, mm -hmm. with a de decentralized group. And so then you will follow where the, you know, where the governance group uh, decision-making goes. I see. Um, so there, there are different quote unquote protocols that you can follow uh, to get onto a protocol and to get onto a different world, um, right. which is really about your business and your audience. Um, I see. So that is, you know, it varies that way. Good. Now from, from a business development perspective, mm -hmm. if, if you're thinking, okay, I'm a young new lawyer, right? And I want to just do crypto advising, uh, you know, in the metaverse, then you probably need to establish some kind of, again, internal governance to, uh, you know, establish, okay, what are the parameters of my, of my business plan? Um, what is it that, you know, in the physical world has to happen for me yeah. to be doing planning for the metaverse um and is it even acceptable in the jurisdiction where where you are you know can you be paid for services in cryptocurrency somewhere you can somewhere you can't oh, I see. Um, yeah. and what is that the type sense. of reporting you know that you need to have um you know it, also if it is nfts are you are, are you making your own nfts so uh, are you uploading documents? Um, are right. you uploading information um, in, in the digital world? What activities are you actually engaged in? Yeah, with your clients. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. do you own your own blockchain? You know, blockchain could be centralized blockchain, could be your own private blockchain, right? Got it. It's distributed between the people that you approve, right? Right. Um, the blockchain is a digital ledger. Anybody can come up with a digital ledger that people that uses cryptography and ash and, and ashes um to store information um so i see yeah. so going back to your example which is both personal and business you know you have a client that just said bought a virtual land and that's the personal side of it and uh, but he also has some ideas of how they wanted to basically monetize it by renting it out maybe putting a hotel there or whatever and so i guess you are advising them on how to bring that uh, to be part of the estate plan so we are not advising anyone on what to do in the metaverse or they have to you know come up with their own uh plan of development and, and right. they have their own thing but what we can help them with is yes now that they have the assets or now that they have a business plan to develop that assets and, you know, they're going to earn income from it and stuff, then we can help them to think, okay, where, you know, where should we get that asset? You know, should it be in, in a trust and who should be the trustee? Oh, um, I see. You have to think of your digital footprint as, you know, your kind of your new patrimony, your legacy. And so is this asset for the long term? Um, so should we be thinking a hundred years from now, you know, and, and what does it mean for estate planning purposes? Well, we need a trustee that either doesn't die or that has subsequent tr uh, alternate trustee because you need a manager for a hundred years. So we're That's all incredible. Human, yeah. Right? So you need to think, okay, maybe it's a corporate trustee is a better, is a better fit. Right. And then you need to look at other role players, like a protector. The protector normally is the you know, invisible end of the settler, uh, mm. of the original uh, founder of, uh, of the trust. And then you're thinking, okay, who should this person be that will keep an eye on, <laughs> on what's going on and who, you know, what kind of powers does he have and who are their successor? Because again, it's going for a hundred years, right? Yeah, that's also, incredible. It's like writing your story, you know, at the present, but also your legacy for the future and who are going to be the people that are going to play a role in it. Absolutely, 100%. And think about it. Uh, normally, <clears throat> trustees manage the trust, right? right. They manage the, the trust asset, but they don't 
you know, they are not managing the business itself, right? We're not yeah. business, you know, cor especially corporate trustee, they hire advisors to manage businesses. So then you ask the question, okay, who's the best advisor um, to manage the metaverse business? So it probably is a group of people. It could be a tech, you know, that can write code. It could be that understand code if they cannot write code. It could be, sure. um, you know, uh, it could be the uh, a business a business manager. It could be right. Investment it's a whole manager. team, yeah. Different functionalities, and yeah. Hire That's... a team with different, and all of that needs to be at least the power to to hire those people needs to be written in the legal document. You don't have to it. name names. You just right. have to create a formula to um, to ensure continuity. Up, yep. Yes, and to come up with the design that will last. Right you know, for the next hundred years, understanding what the client's objectives are, right? I see, I see. Another question that I'm kind of wondering, again, because of this is a, such a new topic uh, for many people, and I'm sure for your clients as well, what are the typical misconceptions you're coming across that clients uh, come to you with? <laughs> I love this question, I love it. So I love the idea that you call them misconceptions. Um, so, um, uh, one of the biggest misconceptions is um, not understanding the mm. consequences of not planning, oh, you know, and the second is not talking to the family about it. So mm. we have a lot of people that comes and say, well, we want to leave all this legacy to our family, right? The, right. the family is it. Um, they, never they never talk to their family to let them know. <laughs> so we do yeah. all this planning. Oh. to 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 create you know we we select beneficiaries we put powers in place and all this other stuff oh, I see. there is no conversation so on the other hand um as a beneficiary as an heir imagine receiving cryptocurrency and you don't want it you know you don't understand it you don't know the risk you're actually terrified we have clients that are terrified about this new idea for philosophical reasons for not they only want you know oh, the rumors they hear you know the scams yeah. the you know the once environmental the, risks all that the environmental part is really divisive between yeah. people um for good or bad reason whatever it is but um but yeah so if you don't have an intelligent um educated conversation with your heirs it, it could mm. be that they are just completely refusing the gift or they might be making wow. mistakes in receiving the gift you know to receive crypto you have to have a crypto wallet you oh, have yeah. to set it up. I don't know if you ever, oh, you probably did, like setting up a MetaMask account. Yeah. yeah I, I, not that easy, right? No, no, not at all. No, it took me not a while to figure out. <laughs> right? Yes. So so there are people that are, that are just like, why? And once you receive your million dollars in crypto, good luck in, that, in getting them out. You know, they're hard. It's, it's not really, easy. It's not easy. Yeah. And, and, people, and, 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 and people are so still in that, you know, they're excited about it. But at the end, you know, when it comes to them receiving this money in crypto uh, or receiving NFTs, they either don't see the value. Some people don't like the art. You know, art is... Yeah. The beauty of art is that is in the eye of the beholder. Yeah, right? so subjective. Yeah, completely mm -hmm. subjective. So now you have a, you know a, a father you know that has created or a mom that has all these NFTs with all these like apes and things, and yeah. the next generation <laughs> they're like, no, this is old style stuff. Yeah. you know where where are my older new ones? And yeah. so they don't see the value. So then again, you know, are your heirs is your family the best mm. beneficiary you know also right. if you if instead of them you choose to leave it to a museum for example mm -hmm. there are all sorts of issues there because you know if you don't tell the museum yeah. that you're leaving them stuff either physical physical things uh you know painting right. and objects right. or even worse uh digital stuff well they might refuse it you know, or I it might see. take a long time for them to get it. And if they get it, then they could just turn around and resell it or put it in their basement, you know, in the dark forever. So yeah. my best suggestion to people is not only do the planning, not only meet with the people and have a conversation, have a conversation and go explore who are the best people that are there to receive the gifts. Ask I almost see. for permission to give the gifts. Because yeah. It's not that straightforward. No, that's uh, I can definitely see that. It's crazy. But, and as you've been working with clients and kind of dabbling in the, this new category of the metaverse and it's all its weird implications, 
where do you see the future for virtual assets, estate planning in the metaverse? I mean, how this is going to evolve? I wish I could be a forecaster. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just you know, the, the from what you've phrase, seen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the famous phrase of, you know, forecasting the future makes astrology look, you know, like a real science. Um, my experience, so based on my experience, based on, and, you know, it's biased because I yep. am a complete believer in this space, you know, I, 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 I call myself an, an optimist uh, technologist. Yep. Like, yeah. you know, I, I really believe this is the future. And I believe that, you know, the new categories of lawyers and, their, and accountants will actually have um, exclusive practices on, on, on technology, right? The um, specialty, yeah. Mm-hmm. It, it's going to become a specialty. So I feel that the future will have lawyers and accountants and planners uh, with a digital space in the metaverse. You know, they will have their own commercial outfit. And we will meet clients in, in, you know, eventually in virtual coffee places or virtual offices. Um, we are already doing that through, you know, WebEx and Zooms and all this other stuff. So what is the next step by us being avatars and meeting them, you know, where they play and where they go shopping? So you, you think it's more a visualization thing? Like right now, we, everybody has a website for their company. So the next iteration will be much more immersive and more... Again, and the ability not just to kind of interact, but also to transact and and pretty Absolutely. much have social life. That- Absolutely, a hundred percent. And the social life will become like we go to school in the metaverse. We meet our advisors in the metaverse. Right. You know, we learn, we buy things, we buy services, we consume stuff in the metaverse. And so right. I see planners having you know a presence, and then using the technology. You know, we will upload plans we will upload documents uh, wills trust indentures on the blockchain you know and create that immutable uh footprint for so it's it. also work for storage for basically estate planning you know the blockchain in in other words yeah absolutely and then we will also become much more present in the custody of things you know because mm. people are concerned about cyber attack hacking oh yeah um but, you know if you have $19 million in Bitcoin somewhere or 50 million, because now you divorce somebody that, and yeah. that's how you got paid. Well, you, you probably will come to the act to, to your bankers and said, well, help me manage this, you know? Um, so can you custody this? So I think the custodial services uh, are going to be bigger and bigger uh, as, that makes as sense. we go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So just to summarize, this is a great conversation. I really enjoyed it, you know, for, our audience, again, you know, business leaders, marketers, and anyone that's kind of really want to get into this um, exciting world of the metaverse and the virtual assets, how, what would you, would you say are your top three tips for them uh, in terms of estate planning for these virtual assets? Okay, so tip number one, have an inventory. Tip number two, create a very strong access guide that is secret but mm-hmm. that will leave step-by-step step, uh, to the beneficiary or to your executor and your trustee, how they're going to find your private keys because they are going to be hidden. Uh, and uh, That's a major to- issue, by the way. You know, if you don't have that private key, this fortune is gone forever. Nobody has access to it. <laughs> That's absolutely correct. Yeah. And, and so access guide is very important and it's different than your inventory. Right. right. Um, and, and be very spend a lot of time to think about that access guide and what kind of steps, you know, it's kind of like a treasure hunt <laughs> that you're leaving with steps for your advisor. It also and, relates to having that password list. Right. You know, the old world of Web 2.0, you know, million of passwords that you carry. I guess, you know, when we talk about the metaverse and the crypto, it's all about private keys, but it's coming from the same, you know, category of access. Yeah, so you brought up a really good point, actually. So I'm going to put a parenthesis here. So passwords should not uh, be shared at all, right? The passwords mm-hmm. are secret and they are all your own. And right. any type of you know web two place yep. or your uh, you know Apple and Google, they will tell you. You know, they will close your account if they you share your password because then they're not responsible for loss, you know, of information yeah, or exactly. for you know, hacking or anything like that. So you cannot share your password, 
right? Now, this is why there are uh, wonderful uh, places for password protections <laughs> yeah. and all this other thing, because they actually will keep all your passwords secret and, and protect it, right? Yeah. Um, so what, what does your executor and your trustee can do if you cannot share your password, where you share the power to access, right? Oh, I see. And, and you, if you're really good and you read those terms and conditions, and Apple, Facebook, Google, they all have their account managers um, and what you know kind of powers and who can access your, your accounts after you're dead. So you have to make sure that the people that you give access on the website, on the Web2 side, or to your Apple account are the same people that in your will you right. give access to, right? So that, that makes sense. coordination. I see. So that I get that goes in the in, in the tip above. <laughs> Um, and in the third thing, you asked me for three. The third thing is really have a really strong team and talk to your family. And the two things go hand in hand. You know, uh, I am. Transparency uh, is really key. Mm -hmm. yep. Transparency. Absolutely. Transparency with caution, because you don't want to tell them anything that could jeopardize your private key. Right. You right. need to keep everything secret, but you need to let them know. Now. I would never, and I'm going to say it right here publicly, I would never tell anyone that I own cryptocurrency, even if I did, because it's too dangerous. You never know who's listening, right? Exactly. Um, so what I'm saying is like, you you don't have to, you know, open It's a the question also of trust, anything. of trust. Who can Absolutely. share this information with? Yeah, it has to be your trusted advisors. Yeah. And, and, you know, you don't have to go into great details with your family, but you have to understand you're doing a great disfavor if you're not preparing them for this inheritance. You know, it's really easy to inherit money, right. you know, to inherit cash. It's really easy to inherit an IRA, a portfolio. But what about a crypto IRA? Right. You know, what about this? Yep. And they exist. They are out there. We're yep. dealing with them. Yeah, I can imagine. So, Mm -hmm. um, so make sure that maybe the beneficiary of the crypto IRA shouldn't be the same of your regular vanilla IRA or whatever it is. Right. right? So you right. need to be very, very thoughtful. Um, otherwise, yeah. Otherwise, the you yeah, know, you the leave legacy. gaps that it's hard to kind of <laughs> close later on. Yeah, absolutely, hundred percent. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, Sarah. This has been such a lovely conversation. I learned you know, a ton. And I'm sure my audience is kind of try to figure out their next steps here in this, uh, you know, brave new world called the metaverse, uh, you know, at least, you know, get their feet wet, try new things, but at the same time, keep the eye on the future ball of, you know, what does it mean to their estates, to their business, who are the people that should be involved. And you talked about the access, the trust issue, the transparencies, these are all critical things that, uh, everybody needs to pay attention to. So thank you again for this uh, wonderful conversation. And for all of you watching or listening, I'll see you next time at the Visual Storytelling Today podcast. Thank you. Visual Storytelling Today is recorded in Miami, Florida. The show is published exclusively by Visual Storytelling Institute. Learn more at visualstorytell.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on the iTunes Store. Until next time, don't let your big story wait to be told.